Good evening. Gunshots rang out just before 7.30 this morning in a park in Keswick. When police arrived, they found two bodies. Investigators now say the incident is being investigated as a double homicide. CTV's John Musselman is live tonight in Keswick with the latest. John. Well, neighbors tell us that multiple shots rang out, Nathan, and when police arrived, they found uh, two adults in the park. Both were pronounced dead. The Dunwall homicide happened inside this park around 7.30 this morning. Resident Ben Barup says he usually walks his dog there every morning. Today, he slept in. He was awakened by the sounds of gunfire. You could hear, like, I was lying in bed, you could hear four shots, and then shortly thereafter, another three, I think about three shots, but a different sound, right? Like maybe a different caliber gun or something. So definitely two different, I think, guns. That's what it sounded like. When police arrived on the scene, they found two adult victims. Both were pronounced dead. At this point, police are calling this an isolated incident, and there is no threat to the public. Our investigators are working to identify a suspect or suspects who may have been involved in this incident. And again, we ask our community members to please contact our investigators if they know anything or if they have seen anything. Neighbors living near the park say it's frightening. This woman has three young children. Her home is steps away from where the victims were shot. We heard some gunshots and we were thinking it was like duck hunting or whatever. And uh, yeah, but within about five minutes, all of a sudden there was a whole bunch of cops leading us to believe that uh, it was not duck hunting. I used to live downtown at Young and Wellesley and we had a lot of shots in the back alley, but I thought not here. I mean, this just doesn't happen here, but it obviously did. Several schools in the area were placed in hold and secure during the police investigation. The bodies were removed from the park early this afternoon. I've lived here my whole life. Um, I'd been walking to school on that path every single day. I still go on walks every day through that park. Um, and nothing like this has ever happened. It's just very tragic. Everybody's definitely shaken. This is very, very, very scary. And I pray this never happens again because, you know, two lives are now lost and there's active shooters or active weapons out there somewhere. Right. So it's definitely scary. Police have not released the names of the victim or the possible motive for the shootings. And again, the park remains sealed off by police. Also, again, they say there is no threat to public safety, but uh, the interview we did with police was that they were looking for a possible suspects here. Anyone with information is asked to call York Regional Police. Reporting live in Keswick, I'm John Musselman. I'll send it back to you. Thank you, John. Toronto police have identified the two men killed in a shooting in North York yesterday afternoon. Officers were called to the area of Jane and Driftwood shortly after 2 p.m. yesterday. One man was pronounced dead at the scene, while the other was rushed to hospital with life-threatening injuries where he later died. The victims have been identified as 26-year-old Ibrahim Hendul and 27-year-old Deshaun Walters. So far, there's been no word on possible suspects. Take a look at this video captured by a doorbell camera. Fuel police say the woman you see approaching this home is a suspect in a brazen and violent vehicle theft. What happened next is dangerous and a warning. The video is shocking, but the car owner is OK. Our Mike Walker is live in Mississauga tonight with the latest. Mike. Well, Michelle Nathan, I spoke with the vehicle's owner just a short time ago. He declined an on-camera interview, but tells us this incident happened in a fraction of a second. Now, Peel Regional Police releasing disturbing video that showed the auto theft, hoping someone will be able to identify the suspect. A doorbell camera captures a woman wanted for an auto theft at a Mississauga home. Hello, I'm here for the bridge. The woman is inquiring about an auto trader ad for a 2022 Porsche Cayenne. I think I'm waiting for my dad, so if I can take a look at it. The seller, unaware she has a plan to steal it. The victim declined an interview but tells CTV News at one point the woman tricks him to get out of the vehicle to open the hood to see the engine. Seconds later, another camera shows the seller at the back of the Porsche attempting to open the doors when the vehicle quickly reverses, knocking the man to the ground and running him over before driving away. It's definitely very scary when you get a first look at the video. It, it, it uh, comes across very uh, dangerous and scary, which it is. Um, but we're just glad that uh, the victim wasn't, uh, uh, didn't uh, have any life-threatening injuries. He did receive serious injuries uh, and uh, is considered to be a non-life-threatening condition at this time. Uh, but uh, it could have definitely gone uh, 
gotten worse. It happened around 2 p.m. back on September 6th at a home in the Winston Churchill in Eglinton area. The victim tells CTV News he suffered injuries to his hands, elbows and legs and couldn't walk for a week. But thankfully, he did not suffer any broken bones. Police say other suspects were involved. One accomplice is seen in the security footage waiting in this gray SUV. Another suspect is believed to be driving away in a blue SUV that police say the woman arrived to the home in. So the possibilities are there of, you know, potentially uh, bringing the suspect to that location or helping the suspect escape or other means uh, in terms of uh, the generic crime itself. So, uh, but the exact details are obviously being looked at uh, by the investigators, but uh, they seem to be connected. Police say they are still trying to track down the stolen Porsche Cayenne. This incident, they say, serves as a reminder to be vigilant when selling items online and to use buy and sell exchange zones at police stations. The victim tells us he continues to seek medical attention for his injuries. Peel police say the suspect is wanted for auto theft and dangerous operation causing bodily harm. Reporting live in Mississauga, Mike Walker. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Mike. Still to come, Canada's two biggest telecom companies are splitting up their sports partnership. Rogers has bought out Bell for majority ownership of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. What it could mean for the team and fans just ahead. But first, a look at the forecast. Here's a live shot. Cloudy but still warm. A great evening to walk the dog or any outdoor activity. And the midsummer weather trend will continue for a few more days to come. Jessica Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. Jessica. It really has been a beautiful day, even with the cloud cover. And the UV index was still quite strong, despite it not being a brilliantly blue sky. And that's going to kind of improve a little bit tomorrow. We see that cloud cover push out, and it really has already begun through parts of the GTA. But temperature-wise, it's been another above-seasonal day. Not record-breaking, but still warmer than we should be. We're sitting in the mid-20s, still feeling into the upper 20s, low 30s. And even with an easterly wind, it's really not too bad. As we kind of make our way through the rest of the evening, we're holding on to a lot of warmth. And overnight, sitting at 17, still about 6 degrees above the average. Coming up, your full forecast right now. Back over to Michelle and Nathan. Thank you, Jess. We're learning more tonight about the victim in a fatal fire last night. Residents of the Scarborough High Rise, where the fire occurred, are speaking out today about the blaze and the tragic loss of life. CTV's Beth McDonnell has the story. So we looked up and the flames, the whole place was on fire. The flames were just shooting out. For Eva Neveri, watching from the park below, the fire was frightening. The orange mass sending broken glass to the ground. Well, it's terrible. I'll tell you the truth, my knees were shaking. I just remember her going across the street to the mall. And her husband died a few years back too, so... Neighbors say a woman from the ninth floor unit died, a senior and double amputee who used an oxygen tank. She would come downstairs um, for some fresh air. Uh, she used a wheelchair, obviously. Um, so it's really sad because we actually knew she was nice. She would talk to people. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's really sad that she perished in the fire, like to go this way. Very sweet lady. Wonderful. So uh, a way to go away like this, it's unbelievable. When fire crews arrived at the high rise near Warden and Finch around 8.30 p.m. last night, they found the victim deceased. Another person was also sent to hospital with minor injuries. There is smoke and water damage from the fire and some residents were displaced, says this man. How did, did, did it start? Like, this is this a big fire. It was no like fooling around. It wasn't like a little kitchen fire or nothing like that. So. It's just bad. One next door neighbor tells CTV News the woman who passed away was also a smoker. Officials have not released any cause for the fire. The Toronto Police Forensic Unit has been helping gather evidence. First and foremost, Toronto Fire Service wants to extend our condolences to anyone affected by this loss. There's no preliminary information to suggest that there is any foul play involved. The Office of the Fire Marshal has been brought in to investigate. Beth McDonnell, CTV News. And several viewers shared footage of a building fire in the city's east end this morning. Emergency crews were called to a condo under construction at Danforth and Broadview at around 9.30. They say they arrived to find heavy flames and smoke on the roof, but were able to get a handle on the fire and quickly knock it down. The district fire chief said roofing materials apparently ignited and about 40 firefighters responded to the blaze. No injuries reported here. Toronto police are looking for a man wanted in a suspected hate-motivated assault on the TTC. 
Investigators share these images from last Thursday night. They were called about an assault on a northbound subway train at around 9.15. Now, they say the victim was targeted by a suspect who yelled racial slurs before assaulting them. Passengers then pushed the emergency alarm and the suspect fled. Anyone with information is asked to contact police or Crime Stoppers. Following a breakdown at the bargaining table, the Toronto Police Association is headed to arbitration. The union insists salaries are a sticking point and the city needs to do more to keep the contracts competitive. CTV's Natalie Johnson has the details. After eight months at the bargaining table, the Toronto Police Union is sounding the alarm, alleging contract talks have broken down and warning that the city's officers will quit the force. If we do not stem the tide of officers leaving Toronto now and come up with a good, solid contract, our members deserve to be the highest paid here in Ontario, if not Canada. In the PR battle to get residents on side, the Toronto Police Association is launching an eight-week ad campaign, plastering these posters all over the city, painting a picture of underpaid Toronto police officers unable to make enough money to stay in the city. The union says 60 Toronto police officers left for other forces in 2024. Their current average base salary is $109,000, slightly less, they say, than in some other Ontario cities. It has been the culture uh, for many years now that uh, that, uh, you know, we go through a round of bargaining across the province, but at the end of it, uh, uh, Toronto uh, uniformed uh, officers tend to end up being the highest paid in the land. The stalemate comes in the context of a big bargaining year for municipal workers across the board. A significant precedent set by this summer's deal with the transit union. The police officers wanting to be treated like other uh, services in the city, like the TTC. The TTC drivers settled on over 13% in three years, plus a lot of other goodies. And I think they just want this to be treated by Mayor Chow as fairly as she treats her friends. This is a slap in the face to our members that the City of Toronto and the Police Services Board will not uh, come to the table. Board member and Budget Chief Shelley Carroll says there is no unwillingness to bargain. I wouldn't characterize it as a breakdown. While well, the union appeals for public support ahead of the arbitration that will decide the police paycheck. Natalie Johnson, CTV News. At Queen's Park, the province is preparing to share the latest figures on the state of Ontario's finances. Treasury Board President Caroline Mulroney and Finance Minister Peter Bethlen Falvey will release Ontario's public accounts for 2023-24 tomorrow. They're set to outline the final audited figures on matters like government spending and where the deficit stands. The most recent public accounts place the deficit at $5.9 billion, with the province noting that figure was $14 billion lower than the 2022 budget had projected. And also at Queen's Park, thousands of people marched on the legislature today to demand justice for Grassy Narrows. They're calling on the province to address mercury poisoning in the community. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris has the details. They came to the streets of downtown Toronto from all over Ontario. <laughs> Demanding justice, the end of the poisoning of a river system that flows into the northern First Nation community of Grassy Narrows. Clearly still going on and uh, it needs to be addressed and the people involved need to be held accountable. Mercury contamination from a paper mill has made life for generations a struggle, dimmed their opportunities. I dealt with seizures at age two, you know, and I dealt with, you know, I have constant headaches. This is an emotional fight for Leanna Leesk. A better home for my grandchildren, a safer home. She's dealt with numbness in her hands and feet, cognitive problems because of chemicals in the water. There's a lot of our elders that are sick. A lot of them have died with mercury poisoning. We have lost our fishing industry, our hunting industry and we need to be compensated. We need our waters cleaned. The ongoing pain running through Grassy Narrows has disgusted Jennifer Smith as a Canadian. As an Indigenous person, she says she's mortified. I think about all the times that my kids just run out and play in the sprinkler and I don't have to worry about it and know that the kids of Grassy Narrows can't do that. This is a problem that's been going on since the 1960s and the people marching here say it's well past time for governments to act. <laughs> It's a message demonstrators paused to deliver with a round dance outside a federal Indigenous Services office. 
then on to Queen's Park to be heard by the provincial government. The way the, the government treats First Nations is, is very unacceptable. This is not right. We should not be here in 2024. Today, the federal and provincial governments acknowledge the pain Grassy Narrows continues to experience. They commit to help to clean up the contamination, but there's no date for when the suffering may stop. Siobhan Morris, CTV News. High stakes political maneuvering is underway in Ottawa. The Conservatives are planning to introduce a non-confidence motion next week in an attempt to topple the Liberals, but they may not have enough support. CTV's Mike LeCouture has the details. It was supposed to be the first political showdown of the parliamentary calendar, but the Bloc Québécois have already signaled they won't help bring down the government this time. Alors, à la question, la réponse est non. Yves-François Blanchette was curt and clear, saying he won't vote with the Conservatives because it doesn't serve the interests of Quebecers. And it takes some of the drama out of the confidence motion put forth by Pierre Polyev. The decision will be up to uh, Jagmeet Singh and the NDP. The Conservative leader had called out the NDP and Bloc Québécois, asking them to help him topple Trudeau's government. The non-confidence motion will have MPs vote yay or nay to this statement as soon as next week. The House has no confidence in the Prime Minister and the government. The Prime Minister wouldn't address the actual motion, but the Liberal House leader issued this challenge to Jagmeet Singh weeks after he pulled his party out of the political partnership with the government. If he cares about pharmacare, if he cares about dental care, if he cares about continuing to advance a progressive agenda for Canadians, well, he's going to have to demonstrate that. At his caucus meeting this morning, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh was talking like he was ready to hit the campaign trail. We're ready to stop conservative cuts and we're ready to form the next government. And whenever the next election is held, it'll be without a long-serving cabinet minister. CTV News has confirmed Transport Minister Pablo Rodriguez will announce his leadership bid for the Quebec Liberal Party tomorrow. He leaves a whole now. He's a very important member of our cabinet and our caucus. Minister Duclos added there are others who can fill that role, but he didn't say if it's a concern that such a high-profile minister has decided to leave the federal Liberals. Mike LeCouture, CTV News, Ottawa. One of the MPs interfered with by China says members of parliament accused of helping other countries meddle should be identified. Michael Chong testified today at the public inquiry into foreign interference. I think those individuals, uh, their names need to be made public so that the Procedure and House Affairs Committee of the House of Commons can conduct hearings into this, can hear, uh, find out what happened, uh, afford those MPs an opportunity to defend themselves, and then recommend to the House uh, a course of action. A parliamentary report earlier this year indicated some Canadian MPs were semi-witting or witting participants in meddling. Chong said today Canada has become a playground for foreign interference. The federal government is making further cuts to the number of international students allowed into Canada. It's reducing international student visas by another 10%. The new target for 2025 and 2026 is 437,000 permits. This is in addition to a temporary cap announced earlier this year that reduces new student visas by more than a third. The Liberals are also putting new limits on work permits for spouses of foreign workers and students in master's degree programs. Experts warn that strong population growth is putting pressure on an already strained housing market. In the Middle East, a second wave of exploding wireless devices targeting Hezbollah hit Lebanon today. Hundreds were injured and at least nine people are dead. Hezbollah blames Israel and is vowing to retaliate as the world is bracing for escalation. CTV's Genevieve Bushmay reports. Not even funerals were safe. Explosions ripped through a procession in Beirut. This near the coffins of a 12-year-old boy and two Hezbollah fighters. They were killed a day earlier in the first wave of attacks using pagers. This time, other wireless devices, including walkie-talkies, appeared to go off. Experts say the sophisticated remote attacks were likely planned over months and relied on intelligence to infiltrate a Hezbollah supply chain. It was a very small uh, amount of explosives uh, uh, installed in those devices, but apparently very powerful. 
A major Taiwan pager developer, Golden Apollo, said it had not made the devices, but subcontracted manufacturing to a maker in Hungary. But where the tampering happened is still unclear. Officials in Lebanon pointed the finger at Israel for the attacks, and while the target appeared to be Hezbollah, they said children and elderly people were among victims. Indeed, it was a sort of a mass aggression, and it's clearly an escalation. Israel has not referred directly to the blast, but moved military efforts north near the border with Lebanon. And around the world, many countries are now bracing for the next moves from both sides. We remain very clear about the importance of all parties avoiding any steps that could further escalate the conflict. Experts say the attacks have not only killed and injured fighters, but also crippled crucial communications channels and shaken Hezbollah's core. And they're going to be looking at themselves and thinking, you know, who's next? The U.N. has urged for de-escalation and says that the terror and fear unleashed by these attacks is profound. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. In New York, the United Nations General Assembly voted in favor of a motion demanding Israel end its presence in the Gaza Strip and occupied West Bank within a year. The non-binding Palestinian draft resolution passed 124 to 14. It comes in response to a ruling by the top U.N. court in July that said Israel's presence in the territories is unlawful and must end. Canada abstained from today's vote, saying the motion was too one-sided to support. But Ottawa agrees that Israel is illegally occupying Palestinian territories. The Israelis say the vote amounts to diplomatic terrorism. Norway has become the first country in the world to have more electric vehicles than gas-powered ones. EVs now make up more than 90 percent of new vehicle sales. There are 2.8 million passenger vehicles registered in the country. A little over 26 percent of them are fully electric, just edging out gas vehicles. Right now, about one-third of registered vehicles in Norway are diesel, making them the most popular. But officials predict EVs will surpass that by the year 2026. We turn your attention now to a place in our city you might not know exists, a safe space for survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Their trauma is unthinkable and yet far too prevalent. CTV's Raheem Ladani reports tonight on how the Gatehouse is helping individuals heal and reclaim their voices. If this space that we're creating inside of us had a voice, what would it say? Tackling trauma through creative expression. Art therapy is a tool used at the gatehouse. It helps adults address their lived childhood sexual abuse. It's a container for holding everything sometimes that we can't hold with just words. It creates the spaciousness for us to hold our pain and our challenges. Since 1998, this restored Victorian house on the lakeshore has been a safe environment for people to reclaim their voices. Stewart has once again found his after coming to the gatehouse in his 50s. He was just six years old when the abuse began, lasting more than a decade. When you're alone and uh, you can't talk about what's, what you're feeling and thinking and, and to bring it to a better understanding to yourself, then how are you supposed to continue in life and be a contributor to society when you feel you don't fit in? Stewart went through the program. It's led by staff and volunteers, many of whom are also adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Everything we do here is intentional. Even walking up those five steps, you're coming into a home. Last year, we were just shy of uh, 300 people coming forward. Um, it's still a very uh, stigmatized and taboo subject for many people. Through its work, the Gatehouse continues to break down that barrier. And advocates like Stuart are living proof that trauma does not define them. I'm a much better person than I was when I came in here, and I could actually say, I love myself, which is a hard, was probably the hardest thing, probably the hardest thing I ever had to, to do and say for myself. In an effort to better educate students on sexual abuse, the Gatehouse is hoping Bill 123 will soon pass in the Ontario Legislature. Known as Aaron's Law, it would require school boards to both teach students how to recognize and report child sexual abuse. Raheem Ladani, CTV News. The Gatehouse has to be able to, has to fundraise to be able to do the work that they do. Their annual Healing the Voice Within fundraising gala is coming up next month, October 3rd. It's at the Liberty Grand. I'm the MC, and you can still buy tickets and support them at thegatehouse.org. 
And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, the countdown is on to Taylor Swift coming to Toronto. She'll be here in less than two months, and some fans are still hoping they can buy tickets. But watch out you don't get scammed. One family just lost $1,800. That story is just ahead. The hot spot today, still northern Ontario, Thunder Bay holding on to some pretty warm weather, looking at 29.5 for the high. Southern Ontario, we were warm too, but we are going to see temperatures increase just a little bit as we head into the day tomorrow. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast and stay with us. We have another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. Well, you probably know Taylor Swift brings her Eras tour to Toronto in November for six concerts, and some fans are still holding out hope that they can find tickets. But getting seats for the sold-out shows is next to impossible, and you have to be careful you don't get scammed. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. Nathan and Michelle, a mother wanted to surprise her daughter with tickets to see Taylor Swift, and a friend said someone had posted on Facebook they had some for sale. But the Facebook account had been hacked, there were no tickets, and she was scammed out of $1,800. Taylor Swift's Eras Tour is the highest grossing concert tour of all time, surpassing the $1 billion mark. Swift will play six shows this November at the Rogers Centre, and fans have been scrambling to find tickets. To get them on Ticketmaster, the radio stations, everything, because she's such a fan. Um, and then I kind of gave up. Dana Caputo of Tottenham wanted them for her seven-year-old daughter Gia's birthday. Gia loves to dance to Taylor Swift's songs and perform her music. She'd love to see the superstar in concerts. I will feel shocked and really happy. Caputo was excited when a co-worker said a friend was selling a pair of tickets to the concert on Facebook. She messaged the person, sent $1,800, but when they kept asking for more money, she discovered the friend's account had been hacked and she had been scammed. I didn't understand how somebody could, you know, just take advantage of somebody else. And it was for something for a seven-year-old girl, you know? Nobody is selling their Taylor Swift tickets on Facebook. Nobody. Eric Alper says if you see Taylor Swift tickets being sold through social media, it's most likely a scam. It's so common to see posts on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook from people claiming to have extra tickets for sale. And unless that person personally knows the seller, it's really just best to ignore all those types of transactions. Alper says to avoid getting ripped off, use certified ticket reseller sites like StubHub. But when we check, seats farthest from the stage are more than $4,000 each, and seats closer are selling for ten, dollars and $15,000. Alper says if you don't have tickets by now, you may want to sit this concert out. If you're a mom or a dad that's looking to make your kids year, maybe it's now the time to explain to them the life lessons about supply and demand. Caputo wanted to warn others. Hopefully nobody else falls into the trap that I did. And whenever you're buying tickets for any event, you should use a credit card, which can offer some protections. If you send cash using an e-transfer and it's a scam, chances are your money is gone for good. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. Weather-wise, pretty hot today. Yes, there was some cloud in the mix, but I'd say this summery stretch is continuing. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. It's just been a great <laughs> run for like two weeks now, and I'm just getting used to this. It's like it's not going to end. <laughs> Welcome to my struggle. <laughs> it has been a beautiful stretch, and we're not wildly above seasonal. We're still kind of within a fairly normal trend, but when we do eventually go down to where we should be, it is going to feel quite shocking because it's been so warm, but that doesn't really come until almost the middle of next week. So if you've enjoyed this kind of warmer start to the fall season, it continues. A little cloud cover today, but that did nothing to cool things down. And we're holding on to this warmth as we head into the evening as well. Kind of that rinse and repeat forecast as we head to at least the end of the weekend. But beautiful throughout the day. If you got outside, shout out to everybody in Oshawa. This video comes from uh, our team shooting some video out there. Beautiful. Great forecast to get out with the dogs. A little sunnier the further east you went to an extent. But we saw cloud cover off and on throughout the day. It may be a little cool for the folks to be out swimming, but the dogs don't mind most of the time to get out 
and go for a dip. Now, as we head through the rest of the, the week, that is, we're looking at a beautiful, again, rinse and repeat forecast in that mid-20 range, feeling into the low 30s. And regardless of wind direction, because that ridge in the jet stream is so high, it's warm wind, no matter which way it's blowing. Right now, it feels like 27 through Piawanek. It feels the same through Timmins. It feels the same here in the city from top to bottom, east, north, west, south. It's beautiful everywhere. We're holding on to this heat. Temperature-wise, we don't lose much of it as we head in towards the overnight. We'll sit at 17. We should be at 11. The closest place to seasonal really is our friends out through Bancroft. Into the day tomorrow, we're looking at more of a northerly wind, which typically would cool things down, but not so much the case. It's pretty light regardless, but we're sitting at 27. It'll feel into the low 30s, and everybody kind of with that almost kind of identical forecast in that mid-20 range feeling into the low 30s. Two systems north and south of us, we're looking at high pressure really holding firmly. So what's happening in northern Ontario doesn't come anywhere close. Southern Ontario, the leading edge of that system going up the Atlantic, that was the cloud cover we saw throughout the day today, but that's heading out as we head through the rest of our evening. It'll clear overnight and it is beautiful. If you want to spend some time outside and into the morning tomorrow, a little more sunshine. So if you want to get out for an early walk after the sunrise, it'll be much clearer out there. Then as we head throughout the rest of our Thursday, there's really not a lot going on anywhere through central in southern Ontario. Heading in towards the end of the week, we'll start to see that system a little further north start to creep its way in for us here in the GTA, likely to stay out of our way, but we'll keep a close eye on the system and how it develops as we head in towards the weekend. But temperature-wise, again, we should be around that 21-degree mark, and we're really nowhere near that throughout the rest of this week. We step in towards your Friday, your Saturday, your Sunday. It slowly starts to cool down, but still holds on comfortably above seasonal and then as we head in towards Sunday the official starts the fall equinox of getting in towards what would typically be cooler weather it actually kind of happens as we head in towards our Monday Tuesday Wednesday we are cooler, but that is just seasonal. We look at some scattered showers kind of making their way through on Monday. This comes with a cold front, and that's what's going to cool us down or at least bring us back down towards the more seasonal mark. But as we head throughout the week, it's just a little bit of cloud cover, maybe a bit of a break from the sun if you're not a fan of all the heat that we've had as of late. But overall, we kind of step into the fall equinox, the official start of the fall season in a very autumn-like way. I'll send things back over to you, Nathan. All right. Thank you, Jess. Thanks. Also tonight, it's been 40 years since The Elephant Show. Now the music from beloved Canadian trio Sharon Lois and Bram is back. A trip down memory lane in moments. Ontario's Minister of Sport, Neil Lumsden, first entered the public eye decades ago as a professional football player. And today, he announced plans to donate his brain to advance concussion research. Why I, haven't I seen the effects of some of the teammates that may be a little bit younger and maybe a little bit older? Why, why am I have been immune? There's got to be a reason. Well, I want to know what that reason is. And more importantly, I want the research to find out when the time comes to make things better and safer for those that come behind me. Lumsden played in the CFL for Toronto, Hamilton and Edmonton and was inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame in 2014. While donating his brain to the Concussion Legacy Foundation Canada, Lumsden called on other provinces and Ottawa to follow Ontario in implementing legislation to address athletes' brain health. The minister also committed funding for new research on tra traumatic brain injuries in sports at CAMH. Toronto police and several other local hospitals are trying out a change to their protocols in hopes of freeing up more frontline officers. Current rules require officers who apprehend someone under the Mental Health Act to stay with them at the hospital. Police say those waits can often last hours, keeping them away from their core duties. Under a new one-year pilot, special constables will instead be embedded into ERs to take over their transfer responsibilities from the frontline officers. They'll be stationed 18 hours a day at Humber River Health, Toronto Western Hospital and St. Michael's Hospital. A treat for young kids, young and old. You may remember the children's performers Sharon Lois and Brand. And while the group no longer performs, they have dug into the vault and released a new album. And when we say album, we mean vinyl. CTV's Andrea Case joins us live now with the details. Andrea. Michelle, let me tell you, I covered TIFF and I didn't attend one party. I covered children's album release and I found a party. We're at Mabel's Fables on Mount Pleasant, just south of Eglinton. And uh, I thought there was going to be a lot of children here. But the thing about Sharon Lewis and Bram is that their audience has grown, but they still love them. 
and they're here today. It's been 40 years since Sharon, Lois, and Bram entertained on The Elephant Show. Now they are releasing The Elephant Showstoppers, an album on vinyl on October 18th. You know, I always loved vinyl, and I was always sad when we moved to the smaller images, images because children walk around holding in this, and they say, listen to a song, and they say, oh, that's, I know her. They felt like they knew us. And uh, Sharon, Lois, and Bram fans are the right age to be interested in collecting the vinyl and maybe having a record player to share with their children. Lois passed away nine years ago, but her memory lives on on this new album. It features music that was performed on the show, songs that have never been released before. This is the 40th anniversary of The Elephant Show, so we have come up with a list of songs that appeared on the show but have never been released in recordings before, so they're going to get to hear them for the first time. With such a history, it's hard to pick a favorite song. And on this album, there's, a, first of all, Lois is there, yep. which is thrilling for me. And we sing a duet together that I absolutely love. It's called Love Goes, Grows Under the Wild Oak Tree. It's a very sweet song, and I remember the, the video from it. We sang it. It's very sweet. The group has been reinvented, and Sharon now tours with her daughter, Randy. I love you in the morning and in the afternoon. I love you in the evening underneath the moon. And there's the bell of the ball. There's Sharon uh, enjoying her party. I just want to show you some of the treats here because Sharon and her daughter and her family, they made these treats. They made biscotti, they made shortbread. So they're not only great performers, they, of course, are... Uh, great singer. So this event is sold out. So don't come running down here to Mabel's Fables tonight. Um, but they will be performing. Bram is under the weather today, so he is not here. So we wish him all the best. Uh, Sharon and Randy will be performing at the Rose Theatre in Brampton on October the 15th, I think it is. And uh, so you can get tickets for that. The album is uh, coming out soon, so you can get the album. And uh, I've covered a lot of stories, but this, I think, is one for the books. Um, when we were standing outside today, cars were honking as people People are going by. Adults are crying. So um, Sharon Lewis and Brown mean a lot to a lot of people. Michelle, I know they mean a lot to you too and your children. So I'll send it back to you because I love you. Boop, 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 be doo. Good night. So sweet. Thank you, Andrea. After the break, a new captain, a new head coach, and new players. Training camp begins anew for the Toronto Maple Leafs, the returning roster and budding stars. I thought, not here. I mean, this just doesn't happen here. But it obviously did. Updating our top stories, York Regional Police were investigating a double homicide this morning in Keswick. Investigators say they responded to gunshots in Bayview Park just before 7.30. Two adult victims were pronounced dead at the scene. Police are searching for the suspect or suspects involved and are calling this an isolated incident. What's that, that the victim wasn't, uh, didn't uh, have any life threatening injuries? A warning, this footage is disturbing. Police are looking for this woman and two other suspects after an auto theft in Mississauga this month. Cameras were rolling as she claimed to be checking out an SUV that was on sale, but she soon reverses and hits the seller before fleeing. He reported multiple injuries, but no broken bones. Our members deserve to be the highest paid here in Ontario, if not Canada. And the union representing Toronto police is claiming contract talks with the city have broken down. It's warning that dozens of officers have already left for other jurisdictions, some with higher average base salaries than their $109,000 a year. Police board members say there's been no unwillingness to bargain. The matter now goes to arbitration. Remember to keep up day and night to, to, at ctvnewstoronto.ca and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you ever have a news tip, photos or video of breaking news, let us know. There's a multi-billion dollar deal today affecting ownership of two of Canada's biggest sports teams. John Ehrlichman of b and Bloomberg has the latest in business. 
Rogers Communications is buying BCE's 37.5% stake in Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, which owns assets including the Toronto Maple Leafs and Toronto Raptors, for $4.7 billion. Rogers, which currently splits its control of MLSC with BCE, said financing for the deal will include private investors and it will not affect its debt leverage. BCE, parent of CTV and BNM Bloomberg, plans to use the cash to address debt and invest in growth. The U.S. Central Bank lowered its interest rate for the first time since 2020 today, cutting its benchmark lending rate by half a percentage point. Economists and market watchers were widely expecting the move by U.S. Fed Chair Jerome Powell, but there was some question as to whether the Fed would cut by 25 basis points or 50. The larger cut, a sign the central bank may be worried it has been a bit slow to act. Meanwhile, oil today slipping below $71 a barrel in New York amid concerns over China's demand outlook. Iran-backed Hezbollah accused Israel of orchestrating an attack in Lebanon using exploding pagers, which raised some concerns over Mideast conflicts and a possible threat to supply. Lackluster consumption, though, has seen some refineries in Europe reduce processing rates. All right, let's take a look at some of the market numbers today. We saw the Canadian dollar ultimately lose a little bit of ground against the U.S. currency. On the oil front, we mentioned some weakness for WTI after some gains in recent sessions. For Canadian oil, Western Canadian Select, a little softer on the session. And for the Canadian stock market, which has been rallying recently, actually trading around a record high this week, it ended the session down about 85 points. That's the latest in business. I'm John Erlichman of b and Bloomberg. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. A record amount of cash was up for grabs in last night's Lotto Max jackpot, and it will be split by two lucky winners. For the first time ever, the top prize was $80 million after the cap increase earlier this month. Canadians across the country tried their luck, and in the end, two winning tickets were sold, one in Gray County here in Ontario and the other in Quebec. While they're each worth $40 million, there are also Max Millions and Encore winners or partial winners in Toronto, Whitby, Guelph and other parts of the province. The Toronto Maple Leafs hope it's their lucky year. Their jackpot would, of course, be their first Stanley Cup in over half a century. Today, the players and coaching staff met with the media to talk about how they believe this season will be different. CTV's Sean Lethong has more. It was an abrupt end to the Leafs' season last spring. Another first-round playoff exit and heartbreak for fans. Today, they start again, and the ultimate goal remains the same. Our goal will always be to win a Stanley Cup, um, and anything um, short of that will be a failure. Um, but, you know, right now we're just looking forward to getting started. Since the Leafs last played, there have been changes. Gone is coach Sheldon Keefe. In his place, Craig Berube, who today said this year's Leafs will play a different style. You know, you'll notice the, the difference. We want to play a fast North game and get after it. We want to be aggressive. New Leafs captain Austin Matthews says Berube's message is well received. He's been clear on, on how he wants to play, and um, you know, I think that's been a something that he's communicated really well to not just like myself and the leaders, but to, to everybody that's that's been coming in. Matthews having taken over the captaincy from John Tavares just over a month ago, with Tavares saying change has fit well. It's not very dramatic or drastic. I think, I think it's very, everything's been very natural. Both Tavares and forward Mitch Marner are entering the final year of their contracts. Today, neither would talk about negotiations, with Marner expressing how important it is for him to be a Leaf. It's my home. It's a place that I've grown up. I got many, many memories of watching this team play on Saturday night hockey with my family in, in the family room, just sitting there for hours watching. And there are new faces like defenseman Chris Tanev coming over from Dallas and Oliver ekman Larson, who won the Stanley Cup last year in Florida, as well as goaltender Anthony Stolarz. I think we've improved our roster. Both GM Brad Treliving and President Brendan Shanahan didn't shy away from Stanley Cup aspirations. And I'm not afraid to talk about the Stanley Cup. I think you have to have that goal. I know that there's a day-to-day -day job and steps to take to get there. You can't do that September 18th. 
right? We have to be process driven. And the process starts tomorrow with the team's first on ice workouts. Coach Craig Berube talked about holding the players accountable today, but he said you have something special when you get to the point that the players are holding themselves accountable in the dressing room. Sean Lee Thong, CTV News. Get Toronto's top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV News app. All right, we have another lovely evening to look forward to weather-wise. I know, and then tomorrow, the back half of the week looking mm. spectacular as well. It's got to be pretty nice to give all this good news. I know, it's, it's, it is nice when you can deliver consistently good news, and it comes down to high pressure really holding firmly. We have a nice ridge in the jet stream, and that just keeps us really clear as we head through the next couple of days. We will trend closer to seasonal as we head in towards the end of the weekend and the beginning of next week, but we really do settle into, at least in the long range projections, really nice weather as we head in towards the end of September. Right now, not much going on in the satellite radar picture. Again, just some light cloud cover, but that pushes out as we head through the overnight. It is still nice and comfortable out there if you want to get out for a post six o'clock show walk because you're obviously going to finish right to the last second watching us and then as we get into the day tomorrow just brilliant sunshine we do still have a uv index that is quite high over the next few days so keep that summertime mindset going until we get in towards a little more cloud cover but even then you can still get a burn on a cloudy day so sun protection and hydration are key but look at that fall begins officially on sunday but it'll be hot mm -hmm. love it thank you jess that is it for us but you can join omar satchadina at 11 tonight for ctv national news followed by zoraida allman with your next local newscast at 11 30. in the meantime our coverage continues anytime on cp24 and at ctvnewstoronto.ca for Jess Smith and the whole team here at CTV News, thanks for watching and have a wonderful night.